It's the sensitivity of the simulated climate to the size and altitude of the stratospheric sulfate aerosols. So that was actually the real technical uh, title, and without any geoengineering uh, word on that. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is first to introduce what is uh, geoengineering and why. First of all, people are talking about geoengineering. I think the context is also really important. So all of you are, I'm sure, you know, this is a well-known uh, graph on uh, CO2. Um, basically, CO2 has been uh, you know, increasing in the last, uh, you know, I mean, the measurement started in 1958. So since then, we have been seeing, you know, one to three ppm per year uh, increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration. And it is, you know, well past 400 ppm and uh, something like, you know, more than 40 percent uh, increase compared to the pre-industrial level. And, you know, there are several, you know, literature, you know, which shows that, you know, the CO2 level you can see here, it is somewhere today here. And over the last one million years, approximately one million years, you can see that the CO2 has actually fluctuated only between 180 ppm to 280 ppm. So this is way out of, you know, if you really think, this is the natural variable in the last one million years, okay? So we are somewhere here. And, you know, there are several studies, you know, that shows that this is probably unprecedented, you know, this amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is unprecedented in the last one million years, and possibly in the last, uh, you know, 20 million years or so. And the warmest on record in 2017 is the second the warmest. So this is basically the temperature for right, the last, uh, you know, since pre-industrial time. Um, okay, so, you know, obviously, you know, this is a much better metric to show climate change. Basically, the climate system is accumulating uh, heat. So what is shown here is uh, you know, various uh, heat content in various layers of the uh, ocean. So nearly the reason we are looking at the ocean is that you know, 90 percent, you know, more than 90 percent of the heat is actually accumulated in the uh, ocean because you know, oceans have the largest thermal heat capacity you know, in the centennial uh, time scale. If you, if you look at it. And the atmosphere actually has very little, and also the land surface has very little uh, heat capacity. So it's very important to actually, you know, where the heat is getting accumulated. So if you look at temperature, you know, it's more like an intensive property, right? And, but this is the extensive property for heat, actually, you know, how much the system is actually accumulating. So basically, you know, you can see the size is uh, humongous. You can see here in the hundreds of the zeta, that is the power pointing one joules of heat. So, uh, you know, it's basically accumulating an enormous amount of uh, heat. And uh, you know, this is basically this comes from satellite. So basically, uh, uh, this is basically the seasonal cycle in Arctic uh, sea ice uh, volume. 2017 is here. Um, so typically, people look at the sea ice extent as well as the volume at the end of the summer. You know, that's a metric that people have been using for quite a long time. So basically, if you look at these, you know, this is since the satellite measurements began. So that's 1979. Uh, to here, so basically 75% of the ice volume has been lost. And there is also people, you might have heard about 50% of the ice is lost. You know, that is basically the aerial extent. So this includes actually the thickness as well. All right, so you know, what are we really doing about uh, climate change? Basically, uh, you know, this is of course a hot button issue. Um, you know, so far 23 COP meeting have, you know, has happened and uh, they have not, of course, resulted in, you know, desired uh, emission reductions. So, uh, you know, you can actually sum it up in the you know, last uh, couple what of decades. Just, what is uh, Conference of parties. Conference of parties, you know, that's basically the global community of 190 uh, countries or so, roughly 200 countries. Um, it's just a you know, uh, UN jargon, I guess, conference of parties. So, basically, I think, uh, you know, fossil fuel emissions are now, in fact, about 65 percent uh, above 19 so, you know, there is some effort, but it's not really, you know, where we should be. You know, that is uh, not happening. Uh, so, you know, one of the things, in fact, uh, you know, subtropical and tropical countries, you know, very important is the heat, uh, you know, that is very important for agriculture, heat stress. So, you know, this particular study that was, you know, from 19, 2009, uh, it's actually from Stanford, I believe. Um, there is a 90% chance that, you know, mean, summer mean temperature will exceed the warmest temperature on record, 521. So, you know, what you consider as a historical record today, that could be pretty much the normal summers in uh, most of these, uh, you know, tropical and uh, uh, subtropical countries. 
So, you know, there is of course, you know, serious concern, you know, uh, particularly heat stress and agriculture, will there be a failure of uh, crops? You know, if only year, maybe we can manage, but you know, if there is a successive failure of crops, you know, what are we going to do? Particularly, you know, the developed, uh, in developing countries will be, the, uh, you know, so, you know, will be severely affected. So, the question is, you know, okay, what we should do if, you know, we cannot reduce fossil fuel emissions, you know, this is of course obviously a practical question. Or climate change becomes unmanageable and there is a planetary emergency. So, as I said, you know, one of the planetary emergencies could be successive failure of uh, crops in, uh, you know, the tropical countries uh, or Africa. So, um, so in this context, should geoengineering be considered, okay? So, first of all, what is uh, geoengineering? I think, you know, geoengineering is basically, it's uh, intentional large-scale manipulation of the climate system. And those two words are very important for the definition of uh, geoengineering. Intentional, so because we are intentionally changing the climate system, and also it has to be large scale because you know the problem is large scale. You know we are talking about global scale problem. We are not talking about you know district uh, scale or county scale or in a state or even not even country scale. So uh, the scale is a you know very important uh, um, you know part of this geoengineering, and that of course creates uh, several issues which are not related to science. You know it uh, raises legal, political because anything you do, it's going to be trans boundary. So that means you, know, you have to get involved with the socio-economic issues and the things like that. But let's here uh, stick to the science. Okay, so oh, that's something that's going okay. uh, So basically, there are two broad categories of uh, geoengineering. One is basically the solar radiation uh, management, and I think this is a kind of uh, schematic uh, for that. So basically, this is the scheme that you know we are uh, in this particular talk I will be discussing. Basically, putting reflecting particles in the stratosphere using the aircraft I think that's what that is one. And the next one is carbon dioxide removal methods. So here basically, you know, artificially you basically uh, try to remove atmospheric CO2, CO2, you know, CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, so this is, so this is different from conventional emission protection techniques because in this case you have already emitted CO2, you are actually emitting, but at the same time you are trying to remove CO2 so that the CO2 level in the atmosphere can be either maintained or you try to actually bring it down. I think that's the whole idea. So I think you know, here, you know, there are many, many methods to do this uh, CDR, um, but this talk is mainly about uh, uh, SRM, so we will basically stick, uh, you know, really restrict our discussions to SRM. So if anybody has question on CDR, I'll be, of course, happy to answer them. Um, so, you know, here is a very brief uh, description of what is uh, SRM and uh, uh, CDR. So basically, you need to reduce the amount of sunlight that is absorbed by the planet. You know, if you think about the planetary equilibrium, the planet, you know, the, basically there is an absorption of, I mean, there is a certain amount of solar radiation that is absorbed by the planet, which is basically balanced by the long wave radiation. So now what we are doing is with the greenhouse gases, you are actually trapping the, IR radiation, some part of IR radiation you are trapping. So basically that is like accumulating energy in the system. So now if you, you know, suppose you know the exact amount of uh, radiation that is absorbed in the IR spectrum, then what you do is you try to actually exactly the same amount, you try to, try to reduce the solar absorption in the planet. I think that is the simple story here. So uh, how much that is? You know, right now if you look at CO2 concentration from we have increased from 280 to 400 ppm. A doubling would be approximately 560 ppm. You know, 560 could be reached. You know, if uh, we do, you know, if we go on business if, as usual, you could reach by middle of the century. So, so how much you need? Actually, you really need about two percent reduction in the amount of sunlight that is absorbed by the planet. Right? I think that's all we need. So it's a, it's a amount is it's a tiny perturbation to the sunlight that is actually absorbed by the planet. Um, then CDR is basically, you know, the methods that accelerate the removal of. I mean, remember, the, you know, the word is here, accelerate, which means, of course, you know, we do have actually natural carbon cycle processes that already actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. In fact, a rough uh, number is something like 50%, you know, whatever we emit, 50% is actually absorbed, you know, 25% goes into the ocean and 25% goes into the um, terrestrial biosphere. So only 50% actually accumulates in the atmosphere. So, can we actually manipulate the natural carbon cycle processes so that 
the amount of CO2 that is absorbed by these natural systems can it be accelerated? I think that's the question here. Uh, are there yeah, natural analogs? Yes, of course, there are natural analogs. For example, uh, for SRM, volcanoes, uh, SRM using um, you know, sulfate uh, aerosols, there is a very good example, volcanic, uh, you know, major volcanic eruptions. So these are not uh, the minor ones that you often see. These here, typically, you are talking about um, volcanoes that reach the stratosphere, something like that. Sometimes the height of the injection could be about 40, 45 kilometers. So you're talking about that kind of gigantic uh, volcanic eruption. So the last major one that happened was in 1991, uh, Mount Punatupo. So basically, these volcanic eruptions, they release, in a, you know, they do release a lot of gases. Uh, water vapor is, in fact, a component of that. Uh, CO2 is released by volcanoes. And they do also receive SO, you know, release SO2. So SO2 gets oxidized in the stratosphere, and you know, there is basically floats as a, you know, basically sulfuric acid uh, particles. So they actually have very, very, you know, excellent efficient, you know, scattering efficiency. So basically, they can scatter sunlight, and you know, you get the cooling of the planet in the short term. So basically, because you know, these aerosols can be cleaned from the stratosphere in a year, matter of one or two years. So in the case of Mount Pinatubo, um, it erupted in 1991. But uh, if you actually go back to the records and look at it, the uh, planetary mean temperature was actually colder by about 0.5 degrees in the following year. So basically in 1992, there was a kind of blip in the, uh, So uh, the idea in the case of the SRM is uh, using sulfate aerosols can be actually maintained a permanent layer of uh, sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere because when volcanoes erupt, you know, it's episodic. You know, you have the effect for a year or two, and then after that, it, you know, the major effect is gone, right? So the idea is can we actually artificially inject sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere and maintain it forever, as long as CO2 levels are higher in that month, you know. And uh, once you maybe bring the CO2 levels to a desirable level, then you might actually consider removing this uh, sulfate aerosol shield. I think that is the idea. OK, so then, of course, for the CDR, there are several uh, you know, natural analogs here. So one is the you know, OK, so basically biological uptake by plants over land, of course, as I said. Uh, today, 25% of our emissions are removed by uh, land plants. And uh, you know, chemical weathering of uh, yeah, rocks or ocean. Uh, of course, this is a very, very slow process, the weathering of rocks. Uh, but oceans, you know, currently it's taking about 25% of our uh, CO2 emissions. So are there methods to accelerate them? I think that is the idea of uh, CDR. So this is a schematic of, uh, you know, SRM uh, uh, geoengineering. So basically, there are multiple ways you can do that. The first one is you can put actually space sunshade. So uh, typically, it is basically the L1 Lagrange point between uh, Sun and uh, Earth, where basically the gravitational field by Earth is balanced by the gravitational field by the Sun. So basically, it's, it's not a stable equilibrium point; it's an unstable equilibrium equilibrium point. But uh, you know, original proposal was you know, can we put some gigantic uh, uh, you know reflecting single piece of uh, uh, you know mirror kind of stuff to reflect? But then later on, and there are several proposals. Uh, basically, to put reflecting particles in that uh, particular point. Of course, you know here you need rockets. NASA can do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, basically, you got it. But you know, it's a very, very expensive uh, proposal. Uh, it's right now nobody is talking about this because it just I think it will be too costly. Um, so the uh, well-researched uh, proposal is this one, and I think right now hundreds of papers are on this uh, in the last ten years, basically, a matter of ten years. There has been an explosion of research on stratospheric uh, sulfate aerosols. Um, and then there is also another scheme, which is basically marine cloud brightening. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, this is not as unif you know, uh, as global as, you would, you know, as the stratospheric or uh, this uh, space mirrors. Um, so here, basically, you would uh, you know, go to the ocean area where there are persistent uh, marine clouds. And these marine clouds will be basically seeded with uh, soft aerosol. So you know it, it doesn't really require very expensive raw material. So basically, soft. Uh, so basically, you create sea spray. The sea spray actually contains salt. So you basically create microscopic uh, 
uh, sub-microscopic uh, you know, droplets out of the seawater and then spray them out. And these droplets will basically evaporate and the salt will be basically available as condensation nuclei. So uh, by this method, you basically increase the reflectivity of those uh, marine clouds. And then there are also a lot of proposals to increase their uh, reflectivity of the ocean surface, um, you know, lightening the color of the clouds, or uh, you know, making every roof in the urban area basically lighter color instead of a dark roof because dark roofs absorb and the lighter color roofs reflect. So there are several of these proposals, and I think you know people have estimated uh, basically the technology as well as uh, the cost for these you know basically approximate estimate. And also another big issue is scaling it up. For example, scaling will be a problem with these two because. Where do you do, you do it? You, you are going to do only over land, so there is a scaling issue. But uh, you know this could be scaled up, but this may not be scalable because you know you are talking about twenty very very small patches of the ocean area, not the global area. So, but this is a global kind of thing, so it has the potential to uh, cool the planet, you know, um, uh, you know, in a kind of uniformly in some sense. Okay, so you know, very uh, rough back of the envelope uh, calculation. You don't really need big GCMs to calculate this. You can calculate. So we know that in the amount of solar radiation absorbed by the planet is 240 watts per meter. This is an annual global mean. So um, the amount of IR trapped in for a doubling of atmospheric CO2 concentration is actually 3.5 watts per meter squared. Mean, now we know this number uh, through uh, you know, several radiative uh, calculations. So all you have to do is basically this number, this 240 watts per meter square, has to be basically decreased by this amount. I think that's all. Uh, so that can be done either through changing this yes, reducing this yes, or increasing this alpha, that is the planetary albedo. So uh, in the case of, let's say, you know, the space mirrors or the space particles, you will be basically changing this because you are changing the incoming solar radiation. But in the case of anything that once it enters into the atmosphere, then you are talking about changing the albedo of the planet, right? So you can actually you know, take a derivative of this and you, know, you can you know, change either this or this, and you can do the calculation and you know, what you get is uh, something like, you know, yeah, 1.5% uh, of, uh, you know, this is the incoming, you know, this is the solar constant. So the solar constant has to be modified by something like uh, minus, you know, basically 1.5%. And if you work on the albedo, you are really talking about albedo change of 0 0.01 because the, you know if you achieve the current albedo is 0 0.3, all you have to do is the albedo has to be increased to 0 0.31. So you know, I mean, so it looks feasible. I mean, definitely it looks feasible to do. Okay, what is this? Okay, now I'm actually going into the technical aspect of this. For several years, you know, uh, at least as uh, personally, I have worked. Uh, basically changing the solar constant in the model, which is actually the simplest thing you can actually do. You know, that's a, analogous to basically uh, putting reflecting particle in space. Um, but I think, uh, you know, now, as I said, most of the research is actually really moving towards uh, basically this uh, putting stratospheric uh, aerosols. So one thing we wanted to actually do here in this particular uh, uh, study is basically in investigate the sensitivity of the geoengineered climate. Uh, because you know the climate system could be very sensitive to you know any tiny uh, you know parameters changes. So in this case, what we want to do is we change the altitude, altitude, and the size of the stratospheric sulfate aerosols. I think that's what we do in this particular uh, experiment, like you know uh, climate model simulations, and the effect of um, the you know the effect on surface temperature and water cycle. You know, this is basically the study in the physical climate. And then we also looked at actually stratospheric uh, dynamics. Why stratospheric dynamics? Because uh, putting aerosols, actually, particularly when you put bigger particles, it actually absorbs terrestrial radiation or the near IR uh, solar spectrum. So it has the potential to actually disturb the stratosphere. And also, actually, since uh, as Rama said, you know, I have also for several years worked on the carbon cycle. So. Uh, we just touched a little bit on you know, the carbon cycle consequences of uh, you know, these changes here, either if you change the altitude or uh, the size of the uh, particles. Now, why this is important? I think, uh, first of all, why is this study important? Um, 
In fact, it's several years back, about four years back, there was this uh, study that is weakened tropical circulation and reduced precipitation in response to geoengineering. This actually made uh, big headline news because, you know, then, you know, the study said, oh, you know, if you do uh, stratospheric uh, aerosol geoengineering, the tropical water cycle could be severely affected. So, uh, but, you know, we have done several simulations, you know, several modeling studies before this study, and we didn't really see uh, that kind of major disruption. So, um, so I wanted to see whether this particular study actually, uh, you know, the result in the study has to do anything with uh, those kind of the parameters that we looked at, basically the size of the aerosols or the altitude of the aerosol, or where the aerosols are actually put. I mean, that's the driver for this, our work. So basically, here is the science, basic science behind this particular, you know, the result from this study. The reduction in the tropical precipitation is due to the radiated heating in the aerosol layer. So remember, I think, you know, I've been saying scattering, but actually aerosols also have absorption property. In fact, any particle when the size is big, you know, then you need to actually consider the absorption cross-section as also, you know, in, you know, in addition to scattering, they also absorb. So, uh, so, you know, so what happens is, in this particular case, in this study, what they had actually done was, they had put the aerosol a little bit lower in the atmosphere. So somewhat you know, in the lower stratosphere are very close to the upper troposphere. Then what happens is it actually heats that upper troposphere. So then you are talking about stability. You know, you are basically the atmosphere gets stable and the convection is reduced and the rainfall is basically, you know, basically, uh, so you are getting less rainfall. So um, anyway, so we wanted to make a kind of systematic study using the Yankar model. So this is the model that we have used. So community and system model version. Uh, 1.0.4. Uh, so basically, for our uh, experiments, we have you can see here. Okay, there is a coupler here: atmosphere, land, sea ice, ocean. They are all coupled. So uh, you can see here slab ocean. So for this study, we have actually used only the slab ocean model. Slab ocean basically you are kind of talking about using only the top layer of the ocean. Something like, you know, of the order of the depth of the ocean is only about 50 meter to 100 meters or so. Uh, why we do that? Because, you know, this makes our life simpler because um, you can do multiple experiments in a very, very fast of time. If you have deep ocean, then you are really talking about actually, uh, you know, a lot of computation. And also the model takes uh, centuries to compute. With them. But in this case of uh, slab ocean, you can actually, you know, it's still a good representation for uh, climate change studies, and you can get the climate change results. But in just to bite, you know, so, you know, typically we you need to run the model only for about 50 years or so. So in our uh, experiment, we basically ran the model for every experiment was run for 100 years or so. Uh, um, just a, a quick thing. So in fact, uh, in, the, you know, in my institute, there is a big computing system. Uh, this is a Cray uh, computing system. Um, anyway, I'm not uh, that much uh, familiar with that right now because, you know, as I said uh, in the title, uh, my, you know, this is a, a project by me and my, you know, postdoc. So my postdoc is basically carrying out uh, all the simulations and things like that. All right. So, okay. So what are the experiments? So basically, we have done a control experiment with the CO2 at the pre-industrial level. You know, you always need a baseline. And then we have a CO2, double CO2 run, you know, that is basically given, I mean, basically it's called two times CO2, and this is one times CO2. And then several geoengineering simulations with 20 megaton of SO4 aerosols in the stratosphere. So we consider basically two types of uh, sulfate aerosols are used. One is basically the bigger particles, volcanic aerosols, and the other one is uh, uh, background aerosols. So let me actually come to the status of actually the science today now. So here, I'm actually prescribing the aerosol. So basically, I'm putting them, and I really keep them constant. I don't change them. But in the real world, of course, you know that's not the real world works. What you're going to do is you're going to actually take an aircraft or aircraft and put SO2 gas there. It's going to get oxidized. And so there is microphysics involved in it. And also, the aerosols will get transported into the you know, system. So you are not, maybe, you know, you can't control like what we have done. You know, here we are nearly uniformly prescribing aerosol around the planet, right? But these idealized experiments are extremely useful, actually, to understand how the system works. I don't think, uh, you know, you actually get good understanding when the system is very complex. Uh, but 
just to put these things in the context, today many modeling groups actually really they inject the aerosols and they do the microphysics and then basically they calculate the radiative forcing and they simulate the climate and they also do the transport. Okay, but uh, I think you know this one really helps us to understand in a very very systematic way. So the radius, I think I wanted to look at it. The, the effective radius here is 0.43, and here we actually only use the dry mean radius, which is really very very tiny. Um, so how do you get the effective radius? Because what happens is there is also water coating on the aerosols. So here the water coating is actually already included. That's why you know you have a bigger uh, aerosol. I mean that's not the only reason. Typically volcanic aerosols are you know they have a bigger particle size, and um, so we have basically considered for this study only three heights. So one is the 16 kilometer, 19 kilometer, and next is 22 kilometer. So most studies actually focus uh, basically putting the aerosol at 22 kilometer. I think you know that's where because if you put too low, then you know you could also quickly sediment. Then you are not going to actually the aerosol may not stay there. So um, because in our case we want to look at whether there is a reduction in the tropical water cycle. I think that's one reason we actually also tried these experiments at uh, 16, 19, and uh, 22 kilometer. All right. Um, so why, first of all, 20 megaton? Because I think you know, we have done several geoengineering studies before this one. So uh, in some of our papers, actually, you might see that. So basically, when you put uh, 20 megaton of uh, background aerosols, uh, when you prescribe in five atmospheric layers centered around 22 kilometers, that's kind of the actual baseline. Uh, when you uniformly spread it at that height, it basically offsets the global mean surface temperature change to due to doubling up to CO2. So you can see that, you know, this is the, uh, okay, so this is the temperature change pattern when you have an atmosphere that is doubled in the atmosphere. So you can see there is a uniform warming of course poles are much warmer and this is the lower lower low latitude so the global mean warming in this particular experiment is 3 degrees and you can see we kind of almost offset in this particular uh, experiment so that's the reason we chose this but now you know you if you want to compare altitude you know the sensitivity to different altitudes and uh, different size of the aerosols you can really compare the result to this whether you are going to have a cooler climate than this or warmer climate than that, I think that's the way one should actually look at. But I think, you know, um, uh, you will see that in my discussion, we will be comparing, again, most of the geoengineering experiments to the control itself, or we will be comparing to this particular experiment. <clears throat> okay, so this is the list of uh, the experiments. So you can see this is one time CO2 experiment, two times CO2 experiment, and then we have basically eight geoengineering experiments. So uh, these two experiments, if you remember, this particular the background aerosols, uh, this is the experiment uh, which basically cancels the global mean warming due to doubling of CO2. And then we have put aerosols at individual layers. All the aerosols are just prescribed at one layer. So same experiments are repeated for volcanic aerosols. So basically total about 10 experiments. Um, so all these simulations, these 10 simulations, they were run for about 100 years in the slab, slab ocean uh, configuration. And then we also did 60 year prescribed SST runs because these runs are actually needed if you want to actually understand the radiative forcing. That is, you know, before the climate changes, you want to see what is the change in the radiative properties because of introducing these, uh, you know, uh, either CO2 or the volcanic, I mean, all the aerosols. Okay, so this is the radiative forcing that you get from the prescribed SST experiments. In fact, this the radiative forcing is very important, in my opinion, to, you can beforehand actually, if you do this, you can actually understand where the climate system will go. For example, in this case, you can see CO2 radiative forcing. As I discussed earlier, this is about 3.5 watts per meter square, if you see that. Now, this is volcanic aerosols at different height. So you can see, obviously, in this particular case, when the volcanic aerosols are prescribed at 100 millibar, that is at 16 kilometer, you are still left with actually a positive radiative forcing. So you can expect, actually, compared to these cases, this simulation should be warmer. So similarly, you can, you know, I mean, for example, all these background cases, you can see, they are showing negative radiative forcing, right? But you would actually think 
you should have exactly, you know, this radiative, if you want to actually exactly cancel climate change, radiative forcing should be zero like this, right? But anyway, I'm not going to get into that. You know, uh, there is also something called efficacy of uh, various forcing agents. Uh, when you actually consider that, interestingly, the radiative forcing of these aerosols, it has to be actually larger than this to exactly uh, balance the temperature. I mean, that's a, let us not get into that efficacy. That itself is a whole different uh, uh, you know, research area. In fact, you know, I have a student who is working on that. So yeah, just to, just to note that, you know, look at all these four cases. I mean, I will, I will show you, as I, as I have written here, net forcing is negative in background aerosol cases, though warming is perfectly offset, so you will see that. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's a science uh, that if any of you are interested after the talk, you know, we can talk about why the forcing has to be actually bigger to actually exactly offset the warming uh, from doubling of CO2. Uh, so one thing you can immediately see, the volcanic aerosol here at the lowest prescription, prescribed height, it is not very effective. I mean, that's something you can clearly see from this diagram itself. So let's look at uh, uh, the climate change itself. So you can see here, this is the, all the, you know, here the CO2 results are not shown here. So these are the global mean surface temperature changes when the aerosols are, you know, different types. Okay, so these are all these four cases of the background aerosols, and these are all the volcanic aerosols. So, you know, these results are also kind of broadly known, volcanic aerosols. If you give the same mass, if you distribute it either to the background aerosols or to the uh, volcanic aerosols, Volcanic aerosols are not as effective scatterers as background aerosols. That depends on, the, you know, that's because of the size. Because for the same mass, if you put the aerosols into very tiny particles, the surface area you get out of those uh, tiny particles, the total integrated surface area, it is actually more. You can do the math, right? So smaller particles are, you know, it's just like, a, you know, you can take it as a rule of thumb. For the same mass, if you put them as very tiny particles, they are much more effective scatterers than the bigger particles. Okay, so that's what you see there, right? From this result, you can see that uh, these cases are you know, able to kind of almost uh, uh, cancel the offset the you know warming from doubling of CO2. But in the volcanic case, there it's not happening. Also, there is a height sensitivity that you can see here. You know, as the height increases, the aerosols are also effective, right? I mean, here of course you do see that little bit. But uh, in fact, okay, so let's not worry about the, okay, we'll come to that again. Um, so here, this is the precipitation result. This is interesting. Uh, in all cases, the precipitation is actually almost something like one to two percent lower than the, your baseline case. So this was also, this is also another very well-known result. If you exactly offset the global mean surface temperature by any of this uh, solar management schemes, your global water cycle will be weakened to some extent. I think that is a you know, very well known. Okay, maybe you know this is a little intense figure for the audience, so I will probably skip this. So let's look at you know quick uh, results here. Um, so what I have done is I have actually written what I am looking at here in the title, and the key result is actually put at the bottom. So uh, so let's see the first result. So basically, the volcanic aerosols we are completely at two different heights. So this is for 22 kilometer and this is um, 16 kilometer. And you are basically subtracting the result from, I mean, the, the control is subtracted here. So you are basically comparing the baseline climate with, I mean, the, your geoengineered climate is compared to the baseline climate. So, you know, these cooler colors are kind of, uh, you know, uh, cooling and this is warming. So if you average here, the mean is about point to two here because you know there is warming here, there is a cooling here, so the mean is about 0 0.22. But here, if you look at it, 0 0.95. So that means this particular geoengineered climate is not as effective as this one. So which clearly shows that if you put volcanic aerosols, if you are only dealing with volcanic aerosols, if you put them at you know higher in the atmosphere, you actually you know you same mass of aerosol, but here the you know, efficiency is. Uh, much better here, they are scattering more. All right. 
And uh, so why that is actually happening? You know, okay, you know, this this is a summary result for this whole thing. So what we have done is we have considered all the aerosols here. Okay, but can you have some hundred? Uh, so then basically, this is the bottom uh, level, and this is the highest level. Uh, so this is 16 kilometer, and this is uh, 22 kilometer. You can actually see a similar sensitivity also in the case of background aerosol. This is background aerosol, and this is uh, volcanic aerosol. So. Uh, basically, the efficiency of uh, volcanic uh, aerosols it is actually not good when you actually put them at the lower level. It is good when you are put, putting them at the higher levels. I think that is the simple message that we are getting. Uh, but why is that? I think you know, it's basically because as solar radiation comes in, you know, if you take any, you know, it actually, with, if you make a profile of a vertical profile of a solar radiation coming in, you are actually going to see a solar radiation, you know, reduced. So if you put that at a higher level, you actually are, you know, the radiation that is available for scattering is more. I mean, that's why, you know, when you put it at a higher level, uh, that is happening. I mean, that is part of the story, uh, but I think that that is the main story for this. Okay, so uh, then I think what we have done is. Comparing volcanic and background aerosols at the same height. Same height, 16 kilometers, right? And this is volcanic aerosol and this is uh, uh, background aerosol. And here you can see the mean is pretty close to zero. So the uh, background aerosols are extremely good, right, compared to volcanic aerosols. If you have the same mass, volcanic aerosols are actually not able to, out of three degrees, they are canceling only about two thirds. So still one third is one third of the warming is actually left, right? I think uh, again, you know, that's the same uh, as I already explained. Uh, these smaller particles are very efficient in scattering, so that's what you are actually seeing here. And you know what happens to rainfall? Uh, rainfall, interestingly, you know, if you actually cool the planet, the rainfall will, you know, this is on a very simple science. If the, when the planet warms. The hydrological cycle actually gets accelerated. When the planet cools, you are basically decelerating the hydrological cycle. So, compared to the volcanic aerosol case, the background aerosol we know that it is actually cooler because if you if you recall the previous uh, slide, that was warmer by about one degree. So, you do actually see you know these red colors. Uh, they do show uh, reduction in precipitation. There is much more red and yellow here than here. So the background aerosols, while they are really good uh, scatterers, uh, they do actually, of course, uh, you know, lead to larger reduction in uh, precipitation, right? Then I also talked about this uh, stratospheric, uh, you know, effects. So if you remember, volcanic aerosols are particles are bigger, so they have larger absorption cross section, and in fact, in this model, volcanic aerosols absorb both near IR solar radiation as well as uh, terrestrial radiation, but in the case of background aerosol, actually, they're very tiny. So they have some absorption cross-section only in the near IR solar radiation. So you can see the warming is extremely small when you compare, uh, you know, this again, uh, the aerosol, in this case, the aerosols are at 19 kilometers or so. Um, so you can see the large warming here, almost, you know, getting close to local warmings are about 10 degrees, right? 10 degrees, uh, more than 10 actually you get. But here, you know, you are restricted to one to two degrees uh, warming. So these, you know, of course, they will affect the stratospheric dynamics as, you know, as I have shown here using these contour lines. These contours are basically the zonal mean winds. So you can see larger changes in the stratospheric winds in the case of the volcanic aerosols, but you don't see such large changes in the case of uh, uh, background aerosols. All right. Um, so next, uh, you know, also we, we did look at uh, water vapor changes in the stratosphere. So when you actually inject volcanic aerosols, what happens is there is some amount of surface warming left. And in our previous studies, we have actually shown water vapor changes in the stratosphere, they actually scale with mean surface temperature change. So for example, in the case of two times CO2, that is if you double atmospheric CO2 concentration, water vapor in the stratosphere increases. Why does it increase? Because what happens is, Water vapor in the start troposphere actually increases when you have warming. So that increased water vapor, you know, this is stratospheric troposphere exchange. In the tropical area, basically, water vapor gets into the stratosphere. So in the case of, if you remember, in the case of uh, all the background aerosol cases, the temperature change is very, very close to the uh, control, you know, the baseline simulation. 
So that's why water vapor changes are pretty close to zero. But in the case of uh, volcanic aerosols, because we have a surface warming, uh, which means there is you know, some significant amount of water increase in the water vapor in the, stat uh, in the troposphere, which actually gets into the um, troposphere. That's what you see in the case of. So even, you know, I mean, not only the stratospheric events uh, are temperature, also water vapor is different in the two, uh, you know, either whether you use um, volcanic aerosols or you use uh, uh, the background aerosols. All right, so now just a little bit about the carbon cycle here. So I think mainly we looked at, uh, you know, this is uh, another interesting feature of the stratospheric uh, aerosol. So generally when you put stratospheric aerosols, the diffuse radiation actually would increase, but direct radiation would actually decrease because, you know, ultimately, you know, the total, there is a decrease in the sunlight that reaches the surface. So you can see here, this is what I have shown here is for the okay, case of volcanic aerosol, minus two times CO2 here. So from now onwards, for the carbon cycle, we look at the minus, uh, you know, subtract from two times CO2. The reason is carbon cycle actually has what is called the CO2, you know, the increasing, when you increase the atmospheric CO2 concentration, there is basically, you know, this the CO2 fertilization effect. So that could actually alter GPP and PP. So now you don't want to actually mix up two things, you know, the effect of CO2 and the effect of uh, solar radiation management. So you want to isolate the solar radiation management effect only. So you basically then, you know, what you do is you basically subtract uh, the two times CO2 from your experiments. So you can see in the case of uh, uh, background aerosol, the increase is 10 watts per meter square. So in this case, I mean, if you remember, you know, the volcanic aerosols are not as good, uh, you know, uh, scatterers as the background aerosols, right? So because of that, you can see generally the diffuse radiation increase at the surface is more in the case of uh, background aerosols than the volcanic uh, aerosol cases. And here is the direct radiation. So the direct radiation, you know, I mean, kind of balance here. So here, here the decrease in this case is more than the volcanic uh, Aerosols. So um, now, what are the consequences of this in the carbon cycle? Uh, so you know, in this in the CESM model, you, know, you do have actually calculation of uh, shaded and uh, sunlit. Shaded basically refers to photosynthesis from diffuse radiation, and uh, sunlit, you know, uh, GPP refers to uh, basically the GPP due to uh, direct light. So uh, what you can see here is, in this case, there is an increase much more increase in the background aerosol case, six point something here, and there is only two, uh, two gram of carbon per meter square per year, right? I think you know, this is an annual result here. Now, corresponding, you know, sunlight, uh, you can see here, sunlight basically here, it decreases much more uh, because, you know, the direct radiation is decreasing. So because of that, it actually affects the rate of uh, photosynthesis. And um, now, you know, you have to actually combine both of them to look at the total uh, GPP. So all of them are for the 16 kilometer height. So you can see here the total reduction in the case of uh, background aerosol is actually more. Here it is uh, 70, you know, minus 76 or so, and there it is about minus uh, 49 uh, grams of uh, you know, carbon per meter square per year. So there are you know, car carbon cycle consequences also to basically you know, what type of aerosol you use and also, you know, what height, the mean height, you know, you keep them. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, summary for uh, the carbon cycle uh, component. So again, as I uh, said earlier, uh, these differences are now from two times CO2. So you are really comparing your geoengineered uh, GPP, I mean, uh, geo, I mean NPP or GPP in the geoengineered climate, and you are comparing if you didn't do in the two times CO2 world. So all of them actually, you know, so basically this is the effect of changing the sunlight. That's all it is, right? If you change the sunlight by a uh, couple of percent, what will happen? So generally you can see here, the NPP declines. You know, in this model, the NPP is uh, roughly about uh, slightly more than, I mean, slightly less than 5%, uh, 5 because the NPP in this model is about 45 uh, uh, petagram of carbon uh, on a global scale. And uh, this is uh, basically the GPP about 100, yeah, uh, 12, uh, 12 uh, gigaton of carbon per year or so. Um, so, 
you can, you know, I mean, of course, you can again see the, the decline is more in the case of uh, background aerosols because you are reducing basically the, at the surface, uh, you know, the amount of sunlight that is reduced is much more in the case of background aerosol, as simple as that. All right, so here is the summary here. So basically, I think, you know, uh, what we have done here is, uh, at least, you know, uh, at the personal level, uh, I have been mostly doing you know, geoengineering simulations uh, like three, four years back. Uh, we were doing only with the solar constant reduction. Then we got into this uh, using basically background aerosols you know, as basically a technique to, as a you know, geoengineering technique. But in this study, basically, we got the capability to also do volcanic uh, aerosol and understand how they differ from the background aerosol. Um, and then I think here are the key key results here for the same mass, smaller size particles are more effective, and you know in scattering and cooling the planet. I think that is. I think this is very important. If you have the same mass, I think that is the key. You know, you can always adjust the mass and get the result that you want, right? So, but I think you know, these kind of idealized experiments actually tell you these kind of you know simple differences, uh, right? And then large scale, uh, yeah, large size volcanic particles, of course, you know, heat the stratosphere, and you know they could cause large changes in the stratosphere. And finally, volcanic aerosols lead to you know larger cooling when they are located at you know uh, higher uh, altitude. And I think you know there is also you know you can define you know if you want to really simplify your result, uh, what we call is uh, you know, efficacy or you know, effectiveness of these aerosols. Um, so you can, you know, get, you know, how much cooling you get per, per ton of, you know, let's say aerosol or per 10 ton. In this case, what we have done is, if you look at this uh, units here, degree C uh, per 10 megaton of, uh, so if you put uh, 10 megaton of uh, aerosol, how much cooling actually you get. So obviously you can see here, the background aerosols are much more efficient. They, you, know, you get something like 1.5 degrees per 10 megaton of uh, aerosol. Uh, but in the case of uh, volcanic aerosols, you can get as low as uh, 1.1 or so. This is actually a simple way of representing your result. So, but if you look at the literature, they actually don't use this 10 megaton of uh, prescribed aerosol because uh, most modeling groups, they inject aerosols. So they inject basically, the rate they give is okay whether you are doing five megaton per year or 10 megaton per year. So if you look at the literature, you will see that the efficacy defined in terms of uh, degree of uh, C cooling uh, caused by five megaton per year or you know 10 megaton per year. So that's a, you know, just to be, be aware of that uh, uh, minor. But anyway, the concept is uh, kind of similar. And I just want to conclude by you know showing this particular result, you know, how this study differs from, you know, what we have done here. So uh, basically, you can see the, you know, okay, so let's see, there are three graphs here. So this is the way in this particular 2014 study, the aerosols are actually prescribed. So number one, these aerosol concentration prescription, they are not uniform. They are focused in the tropical area. So obviously, you would, I mean, you know, that's, you know, if you want to do geoengineering, that's what you would do because Sunlight is mostly available in the tropics. So instead of uniformly prescribing aerosol, they have actually a little bit, they are done realistically in the sense they have put most of the aerosols right here. Now, also if you look at these aerosols, they are somewhere close to, let's say this is 100 millibar. So in the tropics actually, uh, you know, you can actually have the tropopause even actually beyond, you know, sometimes it can actually go above this tropopause. Right? So let's look at the height actually. You know, if you look at the, you know, any climatological profile of the tropopause, you would actually sometimes, you know, actually the tropopause actually extends all the way to 20 kilometers. So uh, if you see here, so their particles actually are, some of them are in the tropical, uh, in some sense, I think they're getting into that tropical. Uh, so I want you to see this heating profile because of that. If you look here, 16 kilometers. 16 kilometers could be actually in the trop troposphere in the case of uh, uh, the tropics. So, I mean, also see, see this heating rate here. It's about 12 Kelvin, 12 degrees Celsius warming. So somewhere here, you know, we're talking about really kind of stabilizing the troposphere. And 
that probably caused the you know um, stabilization of the tropical atmosphere and retained reduced convection and reduced rainfall. So uh, anyway, I think the bottom line is you know you have to be. I think the uh, type of climate you get could be very sensitive to the size of the particle and the altitude where you are putting, and also the latitude also depend. I mean you could. Either you know, if you inject the aerosol somewhere here, you may actually, for the same injection rate or same mass, you can actually simulate uh, different climate. So, for the same injection rate or the same mass of prescribed aerosol, you can actually have a range of climate that is possible, and that is possible. In fact, this is I mean this is in fact uh, you know we are talking about without really. Uh, you know, allowing the transport and microphysics. So, if you allow transport and microphysics, you can actually have the way, you know, the uh, range of climate that you get could be even more, right? Here, uh, you know, we have a range of something like uh, the simulated climate varied by about one degree, right? Uh, in the you know, warmest case, it was about one degree. In the warming was not upset. In the best case, you completely mitigated the surface temperature change. So, uh, you know, I think you know, the broader um, message could be that it might be extremely hard to, you know, if you are you know, shooting for precise uh, global mean surface temperature or, uh, you know, anything like that, it could be extremely hard. Things could be out of your control because, you know, you're talking about, you know, things like uh, the aerosol evolution or transport, which are beyond your, beyond your control. But, you know, people have done experiments and uh, um, yeah, you know, we do have I think plenty of uh, results that show. I think you know obviously uh, there is a wide spectrum of results. You know depending on what models you use, uh, models themselves have different uh, climate sensitivity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, it just anyway. I think you know, I want to uh, end with uh, you know the complications or complexity of the climate system. Yeah. yeah. Right.